Hola. <laughs> Just came to me. Hi, this is Jen Grant, and you're Hi, listening. Hi, this is Graham K. Hi, you were listening. This is Adam Fox, and you're listening. This to is the Dylan Mandelson, and you're listening to the. This is Brian Hat, and you are listening to the Julian. Hi, this is the Word Man <laughs> of Alcatraz. Señores, señores. Hey, everybody, this is Little Darren Frost. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fabio Mantovan, and you're listening to Julian Dion. This is Dave Sidhu, and you're listening to the Julian Dion Comedy Podcast. Podcast hour. <laughs> <You're good. Okay. laughs> Showcase. You are listening to the Julian Dion. On Comedy Hour podcast. Hola. Episode 20. 20. Holy shit. Episode 20 of the Julian Dion Comedy Hour Podcast coming at you from Lemon Press Studios in the Distillery District, downtown Tirana. Hi. Oh, here we are. And a good episode we have for you. We, that's right. Alex Nussbaum, comedian. Very funny comic. I like him. One, one of my favorites to watch, actually. And if you've been to the Julian Dion Comedy Hour live show, you may have seen him. He's done it a number of times. I think maybe the comic that's done it the most, I believe, other than myself, of course, and Jen Grant, I think Alex might have that title. I'll do the math and get back to you on that, but... Good comic. We had a really, really good chat. It's one of my favorite interviews we've done, too. So there. Take that. Put that in your habadoodle and hock and douche. Um, so how you doing today? Thanks for listening, always. I appreciate it. You've been with me, some of you, since episode one. We're 20 episodes in. That means 10 weeks in. Two, two weeks, two episodes a week. And we're uh, moving right along. It's been good so far. Good numbers, good feedback, good emails, good segments. A few different segments coming up for you, too. A few new ones. I'm off to Ottawa to record some some uh, segment action, which uh, you will enjoy. I'll, t- I'll tell you what you enjoy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I felt like there was something else I wanted to mention off the top, but uh, again, this episode, my notes elude me here. What do we got? Okay, did that, did that. Uh, that's it, I guess. Waste of time. Garage Baby. Go to garagebaby.bandcamp.com. Also, listen to the end of every episode. This is what I wanted to add. Make sure to s- not skip to the end, but if you have, if you haven't already. All the way to the end, there's a little blooper, a little behind the scenes, little Julian Dion comedy bloopers for you, our scenes behind the. So if you haven't, every episode has them. I think with the exception of one or two, but go back, go back and listen to, uh, it, you don't have to listen to the whole thing, just go check out an episode, skip all the way to the end and um, yeah, get a little taste of what it's like here at Lemon Press Studios. I guess. I don't know. I don't see a notesies. Um, learned recently that you shouldn't... Uh, oh, let me do this, actually. Uh, my mic's really hot and my uh, my cans are loud. My headphones. Yeah, I'm getting a lot. Welcome back to the Jack Off Hour. This is DJ... 
Easy Dick. I always wanted to do that. DJ Easy Dick. Remember that? Doggy Style? 1994, maybe? One? Classic. DJ Easy Dick coming at you. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, I, re- I realized recently or learned or, or reaffirmed something I knew, uh, which is to never, you should never, ever, 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 ever do this. And never Google any symptoms. It's always terminal cancer, no matter what it is. And it never, it's never an uplifting experience. You never feel better about your ailment when you Google, when you take it to Google. Don't do it. My girlfriend, Jen Grant, whom you know and love, she uh, had this little red spot on her, on her temple. And I was away, and she, in that time, she took it to Google, and she convinced herself she had cancer. And I mean fully convinced she had accepted it, come, come to terms with it, and she had an appointment for, uh, to the dermatologist. So she told me, she's like... Uh, because she had sort of mentioned the little spot, a little red spot. And every time she scratched it, it really hurt. And it was like, it, it was there for a long time, four months almost. And she had mentioned it a couple times. So decided to take it into her own hands and diagnose herself over Google. And of course, as it always is, it came back cancer. And so she told me, you know, just I'm going to the dermatologist on Friday. Um, just so you know, I have cancer. And it's okay, though. It's a very treatable form of skin cancer. I've looked it up. And it's fine. Everything's going to be fine. But I'm going to have to go through this for a little bit. And I'm like, are you crazy? Don't Google things like that. I tell you, never do that. She's like, yeah, I just can't imagine what else it could be. Therefore, it's got to be cancer. And the internet can confirmed it. I mean, I'm like, yeah, but you're not a dermatologist. You haven't... Dermatologist. You haven't spent seven years studying skin only specializing in the millions of possibilities like it could be a million things don't worry about it and as i'm telling her this i can tell she's just like well that's nice of you to say but i have cancer it's okay so i I called her out i'm like you don't believe me right now she's like no i it's it's fine i appreciate you trying to to support me with with positivity and and um, hope, but it's fine, it's okay. I've it's you know I'm fair skinned. These things happen. We'll get through it. So I'm like, oh my god, stop it! You're being insane. Go just go to the dermatologist Friday. Don't worry about it until then. Leave it to the experts and not fucking Google. So sure enough, she goes to the dermatologist on Friday and uh, she does the gets the exam and. Uh, you know, she she highlights the little red dot she has on her. It was kind of an indent, like a little indent sort of thing, a red. She tells it. The dermatologist sort of looks at it, and uh, yeah, I don't. It doesn't seem like anything I would worry about too too much. So, like, how long has it been there? Oh, and the thing is, I should say she had had gone to another doctor a couple months before, or maybe a month before, and that doctor, just a regular, you know, a GP, gave her um, some sort of ointment. Just just put that on, it should take care of it. And, it. and it didn't. So she went to the dermatologist, and the dermatologist said, how long has it been there? She said, four months. And I actually have had something prescribed to, be, to put on it, and it hasn't changed. So, so the dermatologist right away is like, oh, well, yeah, okay, four months. I'm, all right, you know what? Let's do this right now. Let me... I'm going to take it off. I'm going to, little incision, little one or two stitch incision, nothing major. I'll just send it off, better safe than sorry, and just, just to rule it out. Just to make you feel better, to make sure it's, it's all good. So right then and there in the office, she gets a little incision, gets the red dot taken care of, it's gone. And now she's waiting for confirmation that it's cancer. Yeah, this dermatologist obviously didn't know. So, it's definitely cancer. It's fine, though, when it comes back. I'll just go into treatment right away. Anyway, uh, a week later, gets the result. A zit. A pimple. That's right. A dried up... Sh- sure. Abnor- Sometimes these things can stick around, I guess. It was more of like a scarring of a pimple, kind of. 
But that was officially the only person that I know to get zits surgically removed. Jen Grant. So there's there's a lesson for you. Never take to Google any symptoms. All right, let's get to my guest today. We had a great chat. Talked a little bit about comedy, about napping, about business, the business side versus the art side, or how to make those two harmonious and not necessarily take one away from the other. Anyway, you're going to enjoy it quite a bit. Enjoy my chat now with uh, Mr. Oh, first, let me do this before I get into the chat. Quick, quick ad. This episode of the Julian Dion Comedy Hour. Thank you for humoring me. Wait, thanks. Thanks for listening through this ad. We'll get to my guest in a second. This episode, episode 20 with my guest Alex Nussbaum. That's right. Is brought to you once again, listeners, to buy from to what the fuck? Buy Echo One Photography. Toronto listeners, I'm talking to you. If you're an actor, comedian, musician, business person, need to get some headshots done, well, Echo One Photography will get you some damn good shots. Also, if you own a business and you're looking to get some some product photography for your website, for e-commerce, or advertising purposes, look no further. Echo One does that, too. Email Eugene, that's E-U-G-E-N-E, at echo1photography.com and enter J-D-C-H in the subject box, line, subject line, for special offers. Do it today. Okay, thanks for sitting through that. Unusually, the music was loud in that live read, but whatever. We'll get, it's the, the, the message is, was clear. Okay, now let's get to my guest. Uh, enjoy my chat now with uh, Mr. Alex Nussbaum. You and me below, just like the flowers, laughing all day long. People I need to lose, sing a little song, then take a shower. Julian Dion Comedy Hour. I like uh, pho. That was good in the winter. Big bowl of pho. It's a Vien- the Vietnamese soup. Yeah, you know, it's the brothy, it's got the meat, it's got the noodles, some coriander, some bean sprouts. It's got all kinds of stuff, sure. It's a delicacy. Mmm, pho. Of course... I was told that it's pronounced fa. <laughs> it's like whenever somebody tells me something like that, I'm like, oh, thanks for correcting me. That's my favorite. <laughs> Nothing finer on God's green earth than being told the thing that I accepted to be true isn't, making me feel ignorant and out of touch. You're providing a service. It's like, oh, well, I guess it's fa now. So I guess I gotta just go fuck myself. <laughs> The problem is, none of my friends know what I'm talking about. I'm like, hey, you want to go for a bowl of pho? <laughs> pho, I'm talking about pho. <laughs> we have to call it pho now. I don't know. It's like, is it bruschetta or bruschetta? I don't know. <laughs> I gotta sound either wrong or pretentious. That's my choice. <laughs> it is a wonderful soup, though, the pho. Mmm. I just like to just sidle up next to a big bowl of pho. And it is a big bowl. Never before did I realize that I wanted my soup to be served in a wash basin, but the Vietnamese are generous. Oh, I considered it a challenge to consume that much hot, savory fluid in one sitting. Thanks for that pho. Yeah, and I sweat a lot too. It's a good thing it's a salty broth because I need to replenish my electrolytes. I just invited into my body like a warm Vietnamese Gatorade. Mmm, mmm, fa. All right, and that, of course, is my guest that sits in Lemon Press Studios across from me today. He is a voice actor and comedian, successful comedian. He's a workhorse. He's got the work ethic of a horse, is what I mean by that, I guess. Um, let's go through his bio a little bit. Uh, he's, uh, he has a Comedy Now special uh, that came out on the Comedy Network a few years ago. He's recorded a gala at the prestigious Just for Laughs Comedy Festival in Montreal. He was nominated for a Canadian Comedy Award for Best Male Stand-Up. And he was chosen as Best Comedy Show of the Year by Now Magazine here in Tirana. You can hear him on XM Sirius Radio quite often, actually. He's in heavy rotation. He's seen some success on that side, which we'll get into in a little bit. 
And uh, what else can I say about this guy? He has two albums out there available. He's got uh, his first uh, album, Absolutely Free, and his most recent that he's currently or just finished touring and promoting uh, a number of bits. So look for those on iTunes. Yeah, <laughs> Amazon, Google Play, whatever it is. Any of it. Just Google a number of bits. And uh, also, aside from all that, he's also mounted a one one man show at the Toronto Fringe, a handbook to the future, a brave new warrior, warrior as in worry wart. It reads better, and uh, and that was uh, chosen by uh, patrons pick. That was a patrons pick. Alex Nussbaum is, sits in Lemon Press Studios. Hey, buddy, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for doing this. Oh, thanks for having. Me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk. Uh, let's go back a little bit. Let's start. Where are you from originally? Toronto. Oh, you're from Toronto. Yeah. Born and raised. Yeah. And uh, you started comedy. I'm gonna guess 14 years ago. Oh, it feels like it. I was. Um, I st- originally started in '96. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's been a while. I sort of started slow, and then recent, and then like a couple years ago, I sort of wasn't doing stand for a bit. So it almost feels like it was 14 years. And, right. But uh, but yeah, like uh, I I started. Uh, just uh, in the mid '90s, oh, yeah, like 18 years ago, something like that. Crazy, and you started back when there was a Laugh Resort. You were a Laugh That's Resort right. comic, as we mentioned uh, before. We talked about off, yeah, off the, mic. the original Laugh Resort, which was on Lombard, mm-hmm. uh, right next to um, the uh, old Fire Hall, original Second City um, space as well. And uh, those were the days. And f- where were you with comedy at that point? Was it is it something that you were passionate about? Because I mean, your work ethic, like I mentioned in your bio, you just work. You're very focused. Uh, it's inspiring to see. And uh, so, was it sort of always a thing that you knew you would you would get into comedy, or or how did you get into it? Um, well, I I I was like a fan when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. I sort of discovered live comedy when I was a teen, like sixteen or something like that, and went to uh, went to the uh, comedy clubs and improv and like checked out as much as I could see. And I mean, back then that was back in the comedy boom. I look back then and I think if I had more guts as a teenager, I, I could have started then, and it would have been right in the middle of like like when when everybody was getting work. Uh, I, I the people who I went to specifically to go see were, were guys like uh, Harlan Williams and mm-hmm. Norm, Norm Macdonald, like were. Like you know, when I first saw them, they were, they were, they were the quirky, weird guys that I liked. Yeah, and um, and it took me like a good ten years before. I mean, I was doing. I part of what got me into it is got you know, we were doing improv in theater class in school, and I found that I was pretty all right at mm-hmm. it, and mm-hmm. and uh, I liked being funny, and so I would take I would do improv, theater, sports, that sort of thing around town, just casually just for fun with friends and stuff like that. But, you know, I didn't really take comedy seriously until I actually started doing stand-up. Like, I was doing improv even through university and stuff like that. But it was when I started doing stand-up, um, when, you know, first started doing stand-up at the Laugh Resort is when I, you know, started to say, okay, well, this is this is what I want to do. And then it was just a matter of, like, getting a day job in order to continue to do stand-up at night and stuff like that. How uh, how old were you in '96 when you started? Twenty six. Twenty six. Holy shit! Yeah, I was. You, uh, yeah, I'm you old. look young, man. Yeah, you I look know. like you're in your thirties. Uh, I would have guessed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's you you're know, it's, like a hundred. It's the blood of the young. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so you get on stage the first time. How did how did that go? Actually, it went all right. I yeah. mean, I, I was not you know um, nervous in the sense that I had done improv so I kind of I kind of already had confidence from that I already right. knew that I could I could be funny and so uh, yeah I did all right I mean it wasn't until after that I started having a couple of sets that didn't go as well that I realized oh okay this is not right. gonna be yeah. all easy yeah I did the same thing I had my first ever set I didn't tell anyone and it went like well in my eyes it went well I got like three laughs in seven minutes I'm like I am the best comedian in the world and then did a second show even better I'm like oh and then I invited all my friends to my third show ever I'm like I'm a comic come Uh-oh. check me out I'm, I'm like amazing and I've never bombed so hard I it was br- tough oh. in front of all my friends I'm like oh. this is what I do now everybody come yeah. check me out and then they look and they look at you and they're trying to like it's just painful for them. Yeah, too. and they weren't even laughing. No, and it was at Yak Yaks in Moncton, and it was just like packed, and it was just crickets. And back then, you can't address the fact that you're not doing well that early on. You know what I mean? You just sort of put your head down, plow through, and 
recite your act in your in your head and i got off and after the show my friends were like you know it was really smart stuff like, yeah. i'm going for funny actually yeah, like, i know <laughs> i've gotten that too where like people say that oh that's smart and I'm, I'm like i'm like don't don't please don't compliment me in that way i mean <laughs> That that's just. I hope that's just kind of. It happens to be smart, you know? right? Yeah, if it's funny, but yeah, it happens to be smart. But it's when they go to yeah, it's really interesting what yeah, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Like yeah, oh. you know, yeah, because it's really smart. I could see why you know, like the, the audience didn't quite get it because I was like, oh, well, that's not really. I mean, granted, yes, they were dumb, but um, <laughs> right. and uh, so for you, was it something like um, you kind of. So you had the improv, you were a fan of stand-up. Did you just feel like kind of maybe that someday you'd wake up and feel ready to do stand-up? Like, how did you motivate yourself to get up on stage the first time at 26 years old? Well, it was actually, yeah, it was kind of, um, you know, me and a, a friend who was doing stand-up, I uh, started doing improv, and then, he, you know, he was saying that he was going to do stand-up. And it was a, the time that I finished, finally finished all my post-secondary education because I went to university and then wanted to figure out what job I was going to get because an English degree was just, that was probably more for my mom than for me. Right. <laughs> and then uh, and then I went to, uh, I went to Sheridan College for animation. And I finally, 26 was when I graduated and started uh, working. And so that was kind of like, he was, you know, my friend was going to do stand-up. I was like, yeah, I'm going to pick a date and do stand-up too. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was like kind of at the point where there was no excuses and it's time to start. You need thing. that. Yeah. You really need that to get into it because it's such a terrifying thing. I was the same. I was like a fan of it. I knew I kind of wanted to do it always from a young age. It took until I was 23 and I was, I had to be forced into it because I felt like, you know, other people ask you or you talk about comedians to other or you talk about comedy to other comics and you're like, oh, no, I've been writing for years. It's like, yeah, that's that means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. And I just felt like I'd been uh, I would wake up ready one day like, oh, yeah, I can do this. But that never happens. You're always going to be scared shitless of, of your first time. What was the day job when you started? Oh, I was uh, working at uh, Nelvana Animation, uh, designing characters and props and locations to be sent overseas to be animated. Oh, cool! Yeah. So a real, real so day job. Drawing, yeah, drawing for a living. I mean, that was the thing. I was, I was thinking, like, as I was avoiding doing, going into show business specifically, I was thinking of like, what can I do that's creative that, I, that to make money while I'm waiting yeah. to do this thing. So you know, instead of like getting a Joe job and then just doing it entirely, mm-hmm. I, I was sort of thinking more in a, in a bourgeois way, mm-hmm. but. Um, yeah, I, I, it was fine, for, you know, at first, but eventually everything turns into a job. You know, it doesn't, yep. doesn't matter whether, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter how exciting it sounds to be yeah. uh, drawing Miss Frizzle in uh, Magic School Bus. You know, it <laughs> uh, eventually becomes a job. But I think it is important to take that angle and, and um, you know, because people f- just say follow your dreams blindly and the money it will come. Well, that can lead to some irresponsible choices sometimes that people don't think, you know, and then you find... There's so many like creative people with like bad credit and you know this this kind of thing. It, you you have to this day and age, especially with so many options available, you have to take it seriously and kind of. What I'm trying to say is like following your dream requires a lot of work, okay? Mm-hmm. But that doesn't just mean work in that. It means it requires a lot of energy. By me, by that you need a day job, and you need to. Find the energy to, after a long day at work, at the day job, then still discipline yourself to go out at night and hone your craft, which a lot of people just choose the craft part. They won't do anything all day. They're still, quote, working hard because they are going out every night, but then financially it's it can be irresponsible and lead to... Uh, Disaster. Well, yeah, it can be difficult too, especially if you're in, in Canada. It's hard because, because um, you know, even when you do reach a certain level of success in stand up, it's not that, not that much money. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, and um, if you want to go further and kind of get beyond whatever level you can get to here, and you know, if you might be one of the few that man- manages to get some Canadian sitcom, but if you aren't, you know, and you want to go to the states or something like that, you're gonna have to have some money saved up. So that's, that's right. You know that, and or, or you know, to be able to ap- apply for uh, work visas and things like that, and then have money when you get down there. So you you kind of can't, you know, you can coast for a while, but eventually you have to get your finances together if you want to go there, or you want to go to the to to the UK or something. You have to have some kind of a nest egg. So yeah, that's uh, it's not a bad idea to to have to 
to to have a day job and work yourself a little harder. And you know what? That's what naps are for. I right. uh, I found like when I was working in, uh, during the day, I'd come home and I'd just be exhausted. I, the last thing I wanted to do was go. You know, like anybody with yeah. an office job, you want to go. You want to go home and watch TV and veg. Yeah, and uh, and that's all I want to do. But uh, I discovered the power of power naps. Yeah. Oh man, that makes all the difference. Just yeah. twenty minutes, and it was like, I, and I didn't even realize. I, it's funny because when I talk to people, I've, I'm like the like a uh, proselytizer of napping because mm-hmm. um, I find like people will often say like, oh, you know, like I can't do that. I can't nap. And then I discovered I've found like a book on tape. This was when I was listening to books on tape uh, while drawing at work. I uh, found out like there was a book called Power Napping or something like that. I got it at the library, and it talked about. Like what you do to train yourself to nap, right? Right, because I felt the same way. I was, I just thought, well, I can't sleep. I mean, I'm not. I can lie down. And apparently, what happens is that if you, if you lie down, your body relaxes. Even if you lie down for 20 minutes because you want to do like a 20 minute nap, uh, even if you lie down and you don't sleep, your body you're training your body to relax and mm-hmm. you will relax to some extent, even if you don't nap for the 20 minutes. So the next time you do it, you'll relax more and eventually you'll just start to fall asleep you're you know after you do it after for a while and that's what happened to me and i you know and it start to fall asleep. and it's funny because i started to it was almost like i was getting uh you know belts in you know <laughs> right. I, you know I started, martial arts yeah yeah it was sort of like i started with oh, okay now i can nap uh, for 20 minutes and you don't want to do more than 20 minutes that's the other thing it taught was about the whole idea of rem sleep that if you go into rem sleep you're fucked yeah because then when you wake up and you wake up in the middle of rem, a rem cycle you'll wake up groggy whereas if you wake up before the rem cycle or if you do like an hour and a half of, and you go through that's a full right. rem cycle you'll wake up and I, and that's the thing is a lot of people will say oh i can't nap because when i wake up i'm too tired and that's not really true because if you as long as you don't go into a rem cycle you'll wake up and you might be a bit groggy for about five minutes but mm-hmm. then after that i would like when i would do this i'd feel refreshed it'd be like oh it's like a brand new day and then i'd be happy to go out and do do stand up and stuff like that but uh then i would uh then the next thing for me was well i can do nap if i'm lying down or whatever but sometimes during work the next day if i had like a late night uh guys would go out to do uh to for a coffee break and i couldn't drink co- that would just, all that does for me that's like cocaine it's like i just spike and then i crash and i yeah, yeah. feel all sketchy and my <laughs> gut rot and all that kind of thing. So I so I was like, ah, oh, if only I could just nap during the day, but there's nowhere to lie down. Eventually, I got to the point where I could I could nap sitting. Oh yeah, and it was like <laughs> that's I, like I, the black belt of uh, napping. Yeah, well, this is it. I sort of got to that point where I was, and I could do it, and I didn't need an alarm to wake me up. I was completely like I had my own self clock, like a uh, uh, internal clock going on, and and. Um, I shared an office with a friend, and he said, and and occasionally, you know, I'd, I'd, when I feel really tired, I'd say, uh, I'm just gonna gonna be lights out for a bit here. So if you don't mind, just you know, just don't say anything to me for the next like 15 minutes. And I would just like, you know, I just put my head down, like not put my head down. I just sit there and just close my eyes, cross arms, cross arms, close my eyes. Lean, yeah, lean back, lean or, back, yeah. just lean back, just you know, just just have my head leaning forward slightly, and then I'd I fall asleep, and then without any alarm, I just 15 minutes later, I just kind of. Just wake back up again, and he and I'd look, and he's like, he's looking at me, he's like, "Were you asleep?" I was like, "Yeah." I was like, so I just, yeah, I became like a Zen master of napping. <laughs> That's hilarious. I need you to teach me your ways because I'm one of those people that say that says I, I can't nap only because uh, when I do, for some reason, I wake up in a fit of panic. I don't know what it is. It can be. I just feel. I don't know. I just I pass out, and even if it's for 20 minutes, I wake up anxious. Yeah, again, though, is that I, in the book? I don't, I don't remember that. Um, but again, it depends. Like, do you do, do you do twenty minutes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you that's what up. I go for. Because yeah, if I go any longer, then... I mean, I wake up when I wake up after twenty minutes, and I'm still kind of tired. I mean, I do feel like I don't know. Maybe it it, it turns into anxiety for you, but I do feel like pretty like so tired that I really don't want to go f- move forward in my day. But it really is just a matter of just staying up for another couple of minutes, right? And right. then it goes away. Um, just pushing through. Yeah, just pushing through. I find yeah. that that's that's all it is. Uh, I also, uh, yeah, I'm all about sleeping. I got like one of these sleep apps on my phone. Have you, have you ever used no, those? No, no. Oh yeah, there's there's like there's, there's technology out there, man. What is a sleep you app? Gotta do you got to take advantage. What does it monitor? I love the fact that this is pod, my podcast is turning into like sleep therapy <laughs> podcast. Maybe someone's listening to this while napping, and it's been with the monologue. It'll be like a half hour at this point. Yeah, Wake up! Uh, yeah, you're you're going to go into REM. <laughs> Get the hell out of REM. It's like it's like some kind of napping inception. Yeah. Get out of REM. Um, yeah, what's a sleep app? Um, well, there's uh, 
I don't know. You know, I don't know if I. I feel like if I'm gonna plug a specific app, I should get a kickback of some kind. <laughs> but there's one. It's the one I use. It's called Sleep Cycle on my iPhone, and um, it's it, that's really interesting because what it does is it'll. Uh, it it like the I you know the fo- these phones they they have uh, accelerometers in them which mm-hmm. is that sort of uh, gyroscope type thing which which lets you know let, lets it know that it's moving you know where yeah right when you're playing video games and things like that that right, right. move so so it can detect movement the phone can detect movement and so the this app uses that in order to uh, tell whether you're moving in your bed so you you place it at the corner of your bed. Um, and, you know, like, I mean, I've used it and it doesn't get knocked off in the corner. So you put it at the corner of your bed. and Like, there's on, a, like actually on your bed? On your bed, on, oh, your, yeah. ma- on your mattress, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, uh, and then it, there's, a, there's even a test in it where, um, actually, you know, it's funny, I'll, I'll, I'll use this because there's just, just nothing wrong with having sound effects on a... No, on please, a, I encourage so, it. So I'm going so to, um, I'm going to put, when you go into the settings or into the instructions, I should say, see, I'll, I'll show you that. See, you just put it in oh, corner yeah, of your yeah. mattress. You can, you can put this up on your uh, website if you have to, <laughs> for images. But, and then, and then you, you, there's like a test you do. Um, you know, you have to have like, I put it in airplane mode so I don't have, if I have this thing next to my head, I don't want like rays going through my brain and, right. you know. I don't want any kind of cancer in my sleep, but um, but there's this test that you when you put it in the corner of your bed, like you 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 press start test, and then and then you roll over in your bed just to make sure the placement's okay. So and it makes this sound whenever you move it, right? <laughs> right. So sounds dramatic. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like a sting. It's yeah. like uh oh, something's something's about to happen. <laughs> right. A stranger has entered the room. Yeah. Um, right. But it's so the, so. This will let you know that it's functioning. It's in the the placement is okay. So it because it can detect you on your bed. You know, it's like, I don't know if you if you have a, one of those fancy mattresses that you can drop a bowling ball and the wine glass still remains uh, unspilled. Right. Maybe it won't work on that. But but you you put that in the corner, and and so it knows that you're moving, and then it's it creates um, graphs. You, it, this is one of the things that it does. It'll actually create gra- create graphs of like. Um, every time you're oh, yeah. in REM sleep, the graph drops down, showing that you're not moving at all. And also, you're because when you're in REM sleep, your body goes into paralysis. Oh, does it? I yeah, that, yeah. Man. So, so that's showing you that you're in a REM. That every, also sounds dramatic. Paralysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> well, that's. Have you ever heard of? Um, see, this is. Um, these are my sleep uh, graphs. Oh, that was, that, I'm was showing. A, that was a good night right there. Yeah, yeah. I got. Yeah, I dropped. But that's. Uh, but actually, the best graph is one that goes up and down very consistently. Oh yeah. Because that's that's like a very consistent cycle. So that's actually a really good night's sleep, and it shows you like the percentage. Like I got eighty four percent that night because it's relatively consistent. Um, you know, like if you go, if you get drunk. And you sleep like it's usually like it just drops into REM for a long time, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, and, and you don't wait. You don't, even though you're in REM, it's not you're not cycling. So you're actually that's why you wake up groggy because you actually don't have a proper c- comfortable sleep. But anyway, um, but what's cool about this? And I was just gonna say by the way about sleep paralysis. Um, uh, when what is that called? Is that what it's called? Sleep paralysis. It's um, it's when you wake up, you're sort of sort of waking up. But your body's still in paralysis. It's the sh- worst feeling in the world. I've had it. It's very creepy. I don't because, think that's ever happened to me. Yeah, because you're sort of like in this half dream state, but you feel like you're awake, but you can't move. Mm-hmm. And that this is like a lot of um, um, in, in past mythologies came out of this. Mm-hmm. Like the the succubus apparently came from this. The succubus is known as this demon that sits on your chest, right. sucking the life out of you while you're sleeping. And apparently that came from that because you're you feel like you can't move, right? But you're still kind of awake. It's a weird, it's not pleasant. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's that's what happened. REM sleep kind of puts you in. That's when I guess the glitch happens when you're in REM, but you're also awake. Um, anyway, so what happens is with this graph goes up and down, up and down. And so the practical application of this app is that is that. Um, the alarm is set. You give it like about a half hour range, mm-hmm. and so when you come out of a REM cycle, that's when it wakes you up. Is when you when you're out of a REM cycle. So you so and I and it's a great way to wake up. Like I've used this thing where you're, you know, you hear and it's you know it's got a nice hearing to play one of these alarms. It's totally like a. Uh, and it, are you finding it actually helps? Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, because you wake up because instead of waking up in the, with an alarm going off in the middle of a dream, jarring you. Out yeah. Of, yeah. It, you actually when it, by the time the alarm wakes up, it almost feels like you're already kind of awake. Mm-hmm. 
So it's a very it's it's not as jarring a way to wake up. And and like my alarm sounds like this. There you go. Let's see what this is. <sighs> Oh, it's not. Oh, 7 a.m., huh? That's not that bad. Usually they hate 7 a.m. <laughs> what Now, what if you have another person in the bed? Does that change the whole thing? Um, that You know, you'd think, but actually I found that it's still... Because it's like, it's it's close like on to my side. side of the bed, you know? Right, you know? right. Um, unless, of course, you're, you know, you're, you're sharing a single bed. Right, right. Sharing a, a twin, one twin. We have bunk beds, so we're fine. Totally good, and that's and that sounds like a healthy relationship. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So that that might be a contributing factor to your uh, success, um, nailing down, grasping the uh, sleep. Yeah, you know, this is part really, of your life. I want this to be more of a self help uh, <laughs> podcast. Than well, because like like all that to say, it does take a special discipline to manage um, work and passion in the in the early stages right. at least it, it's because like you said again it's so tempting to just because all the inten- the intention is there uh-huh. i'm gonna work a day job and go do comedy at night mm-hmm. but try to actually pull that off it requires a special amount of energy to actually okay i'm gonna do this during the day and force myself to fucking go out at night it's really hard it takes a special kind of kind of person to do it yeah no i i, I mean it was uh you know, especially when you kind of want to hang out a little bit late and stuff like that. And the yeah. Next, and the next day is tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you have to do it again over and over. Yeah. Because you have to go out all the time. Describe a little bit what the comedy scene was like in Toronto in the mid-90s. Like, who was around and what kind of... Like, how much time, stage time were you getting? Like, were you getting up much? Um, Not a ton. I mean, it was like... It was one of those things where I was like... Uh, I didn't... Uh, I didn't uh, get uh, chosen by the larger corporation of comedy in Canada, mm. so I didn't get a chance to to do a lot, get on a lot of stages and tour a lot early in my career. I was sort of mostly doing laugh resort, like I do it like every weekend, but it's only like ten minute spots, or mm-hmm. you know. And I do some shows around town. And to be honest, like I was sort of, I didn't quite get. I mean, part of even just starting to do stand up, I realized after the fact. I thought, oh yeah, I'll do stand up eventually. I didn't really think in terms of like. I had no sense of show business, and I didn't mm-hmm. really, I think, um, uh, research it well enough. And so I kind of just assumed, oh, yeah, I'll just do stand-up in my 20s, and it'll be fine, because that's stand-ups are usually in their 20s. Like, I didn't think, like, oh, no, you want to be, like, if you have 10 years, and then you're in your 20s, then you're going to be ahead of the game. <laughs> right. I, didn't, I just didn't, didn't even think of that. And, uh, and I just didn't think of, like, putting in as much time as I could have you know, doing every open mic as possible. I feel almost like there's more of those now anyway. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, you know, I was pre-Humber school, like after Humber, like all these, like it's so weird, like like a hundred new people who want to do comedy come out in a big rush. Every year, yeah, yeah, same time every year. I mean, I know that not a lot, not all of them really pursue it as heavily, but it creates communities of people who like create open mics and, you know, there there just seems to be a lot more there's Avail- a ton in the city. Yeah, it's there's crazy. more available to do now than I think there was when I started. Um, in terms of like, uh, and also, oh yeah, I forgot to mention too that when I started, you know, and I was hanging out at the Laugh Resort, it was, uh, it was a time where they, uh, there was got the guys that I saw, um, kind of around the time that I started, or you know, when I was still checking out stand up, were who performed a little at the Laugh Resort were uh, Brent Butt and Tim Steves and um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, Mark Farrell and uh, mm-hmm. like like a lot of uh, um, of the best Canadian the best. comics, right? I think so, Tim Steve's so funny. Oh yeah, he's great. Oh my god, yeah, he's a, yeah, he's a he's a he's a machine. He's a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, he is. He really. Re- I talked to him about it, and he said that's from starting in in New Brunswick in like strip clubs and stuff like that, where he just because he when he's on stage, he's like he used to be more like that, where he would just like plow through no matter what anything. Yeah. And I guess he said it was Howie in Ottawa that told him like. You know, we can hear you. We're listening to you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but he's so funny. Yeah, he's yeah. a force, man. He's just yeah. like... Yeah, he's great because yeah, he's, he's, he's got the energy, but he's a great writer too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And who and he writes for Rick Mercer. You might as well give him a plug too. Uh, but uh, yeah, so... The, and then they would also bring up guys from New York. Um, so at the time, the guys that, they, that were sort of the hot guys in New York would come up. So it would be like uh, uh, Todd Berry, Louis C.K., Mark Marin were the guys that I'd see do that club. Um, cool. So yeah, it was kind of cool to see them back in in their heyday doing smaller club sets and things like that. Yeah. 
Um, and then, and so, yeah, when I was doing comedy, like I did, I, about two years in, I won their, the Laugh Resort competition, the funniest person with a day job mm-hmm. competition. And that's what kind of pushed me into becoming a pro. And, um, and so that, you know, and then I sort of built my work my way up and started doing, you know, headlinings, other clubs in different parts of the country here and there. But, but I wasn't as like, it wasn't until later on that I, you know, got some TV and then I, and then I joined Yuck Yucks and I toured mm-hmm. with them a bit and, you know, that kind of thing. But so it was like, it was a bit of a slow kind of go. I didn't really, I wasn't like as intensely right. into it uh, right off the get, uh, 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 the get go. Well, it's great to see now that you're 18 years in and on any given night you go to an open mic, there's Alex Nussbaum. I mean, you're still working away. You still, I feel like you respect the craft a lot and, mm-hmm. and are, you're very dedicated to writing new material and churning out a, a body of work that is, um, that's what I like from, from like my favorite comics I like to see is like just they go out and, and work all the time. Mm-hmm. When did you reach the crossroad to, like you said, you turned pro Define that a little bit, and when did you reach the crossroad in your life where you had to choose between, okay, now that I've been managing both a day job and comedy, comedy's kind of taking over a little bit, when do you make that decision to dedicate everything to comedy? Well, um, for me, it was, uh, I mean, I had kind of went through a big life change at 30 where, like, I uh, separated from my wife and... uh, and I oh, so you were married? Yeah. Oh no way! Yeah. How many years? Uh, six. That's big. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah, it was my twenties. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I did everything backwards. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. I was like, uh, I was like, everything kind of got, you know, like right now I'm probably more in my thirties right. me- mentally, which is probably why I seem like right. I'm in my thirties. Um, you know, so I like I sort of did my, you know, in my th- or late thirties, forties, in my twenties, and then I did my twenties in my thirties, and now I'm doing my thirties in in my forties. Right. <laughs> so, do you have a girlfriend now? Yeah, yeah, and you're living together? Um, no, actually, no, no. Oh. But you were married for six years, and you're thirty, you separate. What? Yeah, well, and also like I mean, I was I was starting to, like I was headlining by that time, mm-hmm. but I wasn't, but I didn't, I wasn't really like still fully focused because I had the day job and all that. And, and at that point I had the opportunity, I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm, this is a life change. And I went freelance with my, you know, so, I, you know, drawing for a living. So I could do that freelance whenever things came up and I was making enough money off stand up and doing commercials and things like that. And then I have a friend who uh, was an animation writer and I started writing things with him. And then I got enough experience that I started doing it on my own. And that's, you know, that's where I started. That's where I was doing a little bit of everything, you know, like mm-hmm. in Canada, you have to, you have to keep have a few to, things on the go. So yeah. I was, so I was doing the thing where I was doing stand up and going for a commercial auditions during the day, and then I do some animation writing when it came up, and and the animation writing was great because it was on my own schedule. It's not like, you know, sitcom writing is is. Oh, did you did you get that? I just rubbed <laughs> I rub, just rubbed the mic a little bit like that. So okay, can I do it? That's nice. Um, <laughs> like, sorry, I got a bit of an itchy mic here. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I was, I, I it was uh, the idea of of doing um, a writing for animation, maybe not as cool as writing for live action sitcoms, but it also means you have flexibility. Whereas mm-hmm. a sitcom requires you to be in the room every day, mm-hmm. a certain amount of time. It kind of takes up your life. It's really hard to do stand up and things when you're doing that, and also it's, uh, it's portable. So you know, at some point, I was doing doing that consistently enough that I just went, oh, okay, you know what? Why don't I just do this from another city? Let's try L.A. And so I was able to go down there and just make a living doing, which is kind of ironic because when I was in LA, when I first started there, I was writing um, for shows in Canada. So mm-hmm. I was making my living from Canada while I was living down there. And then um, eventually you know, my work visa ran out. And But by that time, I'd also been doing like some commercials and voice work down there. And so I was starting to get some momentum, but then I had to come back. And then these royalties came up where now I'm making most of my living from the States as I live in Canada. So it's just everything's always flipping and flopping with me. Yeah. Everything's oh, right, right. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, right. So you're in LA. That's when you separated from your wife that you went down to LA, like a little bit after that? Um, uh, no, actually, that was I went down to LA like years after that. Oh, year, yeah. like a while after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about about the separation like does that oh, God. How, how does that like that's fucking that's a major life event to go through did you take any time off of comedy or did you use that to fuel your comedy in a way uh sort of use that to fuel i mean i i was sort of going through like some stuff where i was losing like i kind of let 
I let like uh, how I was doing or how far I was getting in comedy affect me and affect my confidence. So I mm. kind of was like, I need to rebuild myself as well. I had to kind of hit the, that's kind of why when you see me doing open mics around here as well, that was, this is a bit of a rebuilding phase for me too, because I stopped doing comedy as I was in this phase of like coming back to Canada from the States right. and I didn't, I sort of took some time away from stand up and getting back into it, you know, took some time to get my stage legs back. And so I hit as many rooms and I also want to get new material from a new album, put out the, uh, put out the new album. So the idea that, um, <laughs> thanks for that, Jen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a, it's all right. It's okay. I like I like it. It's a little uh, gives it adds color, some background <laughs> ambiance, you know. It's a, no problem at all. Um, uh, it's okay. I'm just you know talking about my personal life here. I got, uh, uh, where was I, Julia? Um, you were talking about um, a rebuilding phase. You're oh kind yeah, of in that now, yeah. but you were back then uh, a little bit. Yeah, of- yeah. I, I guess so. When yeah, so when I was sort of separated, I was. I had to kind of rebuild my confidence. I had to hit the hit the rooms and just kind of just just uh, start from scratch again. It was a bit of a starting over again to rebuild back up right. to where my level of confidence and and that was you know that was a whole process where I I went you know I, I was in a low point and then I worked my way back up to the point where I finally got the um, the comedy special and got the just for laughs and that was like a strong. You know, I almost felt like that happened to me again this past year. Is like I kind of had to start it at the bottom. I had to work my way back up right. to get these things that that made me feel a little bit uh, better about my career. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Let's talk about. Um, okay, so you're a headliner. Uh, you still had a day job a little bit. You go through separation. You work on rebuilding your confidence. Then you get. Wh- at what point does the comedy special come? Because because that comedy now and just for last kind of happened. Close to each other, right? Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, I think, 2002. Yeah, so that was like, um, that was like about a year and a half, two, about two years after like, you know, having yeah. to start over in a way. Clean slate. Yeah, and then, so it took me about two years to kind of get to the point where I got these two. I was, it was, uh, yeah, Just for Laughs, uh, sorry, um, uh, the comedy now was one of those things that kind of, I think that was one of the things that affected my confidence because I saw other people getting something that I wanted to get. Mm-hmm. So it was like a typical, where now I have a different attitude about these things. At the time, I was like, it, it kind of shook me a bit. And so I had to work my way back up. I got the thing, I got the goal. And then I also did the homegrown competition. That so And that was like one after the other. It was like the right. comedy yeah, special. And then like right after that, I did the homegrown. And then I, I came in as runner up for that, which is great because that means you can stay for the rest of the week. And I got mm-hmm. some, you know, interest and all that and it was it kind of got me to the next level um and that's it's funny because it's i always find it interesting when life gives show, it has patterns where there's things repeat like for me it's very similar in the sense that i my goals from last year were to uh to i wanted to do one man show i wanted to do something different and i wanted to get uh, my, I wanted to do a gala again just for last so second gala and it was the exact same thing I did the one man show and then the, like right when it was done the following week I did my gala like it was weird it was like a, a weird right. uh, parallel to what happened you know a dozen years before history does repeat itself and uh, how did you get past comparing yourself to others you said now you think of that differently uh, it, that is is a slide on all comics coming up. I think you you compare yourself to others. Mm-hmm. When someone else gets something, you feel like they got they took that away from you, which is uh-huh. fucked up thinking. But it's hard not to think that way right. sometimes when you're so immersed in uh-huh. in it. Often it's like, oh, that guy got this thing. Fuck it. He took my opportunity. It's like, well, he did nothing to try to get that opportunity. Like, but it's you know what I mean. Yeah. Just for some reason. So how did you get past that? Uh, uh, by uh, like, how do you? Um, sort of transcend getting threatened by other people's success around you because it did uh, at the beginning affect your confidence, mm-hmm. as you mentioned. So how do you push? Um, that? Well, I guess I, you know it's just the idea of focusing on my own goals, and that's right. kind of like challenging myself, and also just looking at the big picture. I guess now you know it's it's harder when you don't have when you you're not able to look at the the big picture for yourself, and just that the ups and downs and. Like some people, that's the thing is like some people who would have gotten the thing I wanted uh, before me. Right. After a few years, they might not, I might be further ahead than them. Maybe Mm -hmm. I eventually get what they got uh, a year or two later 
and then a couple more years go by, and then I'm in a better position anyway. So it's it doesn't really matter because it's it's that whole marathon rather than a sprint situation. So I feel like it doesn't you you can't let those things bother you because it's still your path versus. I mean, these are kind of almost hackneyed ideas. That's a kind of a cliche right, of like right. marathon, and you know, it's your own path, and um, and there are people who do. It doesn't, you know, you could say all those things, but there are also still people who just come out of the gate and then just get one thing after another after another, and then they right. become they become famous. You know what yeah, I mean? So yeah. it's like that also can happen too uh, if you're charmed, and that can happen to you. But in the in the grand scheme, I mean, if you can focus on what you need to do and make sure you're working and you're happy with what you're doing, that can that can fuel you enough. Yeah. I, and also just looking at it like it's taking control over, like that's what I feel like now I have more control over my own career. Right. Where I feel like I'm running my own business versus waiting for people to choose me. Mm-hmm. I think that's a big part of it is if you put your, if you put what you do in the hands of other people's tastes and that's all it is a lot of the time. I mean, even when I started out, like I wasn't able to do this and I was able to do that just by virtue of the taste of the gatekeepers. They, Mm -hmm. some, one gatekeeper liked what I did. Another gatekeeper didn't. Am I, am I better or worse because of it? No, they just have different tastes. They have different sensibilities. Right. So if you're, I mean, it's, it can be, it can be uh, frustrating. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you you want me to eat that mic a little more? Yeah, that's right. Perfect. Yeah, it can be frustrating, but, but it, um, but you don't know down the road there might be other gatekeepers that can help you out or yeah whatever you know it's just so is that dif- the difference like what what makes it that you're not relying on a gatekeeper's taste when you take your career in your own hands by treating it more like a business like how do you how do you get past those those things um well i mean in some cases like i was just talking to um uh the other night i was talking to a fellow named chris gibbs who's uh, who's known for doing like um successful one one man shows Mm because because i got a taste of that last year and that was something i hadn't done ever before i realized how much control you can have over your career if you do something like that rather than hoping that a club owner likes your stuff and begging to get on from club to club to club you know you can do the fringe circuit and all you need to do is pay let's say seven hundred dollars up front and you've got everything else the venue and everything taken care of for you plus press where they're willing to write about you even if you're not at a level of like you know established theater and you can make a name for yourself and you can make a living you can make a good living if you do a bunch of different fringes and all you're doing is whatever you want to do Mm -hmm. you can say what you want it's between you and the audience and if the audience likes it they'll come back and they'll come back next time you do it and you could talk about whatever you want. You don't have to be a certain kind of comedian with so many jokes per minute. You can do whatever you want, right? And that's mm-hmm. an option that's out there. And he was just telling, I, I bring him up because he was telling me that when he, he's from, uh, originally from England, and when he was in London, you know, he saw some stand up and he, and the stand up seemed to have a bit of a disparaging attitude towards this other guy who was a one man show fella. And he sort of saw that and said, yeah, but you're working at this and but he's very successful doing that and then when he came to Toronto and he was trying to get in with the clubs it was kind of he was he was oh the oh the guy oh I waited this long to get a showcase and the guy who's supposed to watch me isn't here tonight oh well that was a waste and then he and then he found out oh how much are the comedians getting paid for a weekend spot oh that was 50 bucks that's so I'm killing myself to get 50 bucks. Like, what am I doing? And then he, you know, then he found his own path. And that's, that's the kind of the lesson too, right? Is where, where the, the obstacles sometimes help you get to a place where you, you might have advantages that mm-hmm. people who go through those obstacles might not have. So it's sometimes that's what gets, what's in the way makes you stronger and, and allows you to have some, some autonomy over what you're doing. Yeah. So he, yeah, so he was a perfect, he's an example of a guy who made a living, a good living doing that. And his, his act, whether it works or doesn't work in a club, doesn't, is, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. He's, he's doing what he wants to do. And there's an audience that's happy to hear it. I like that you say that, that because, and that you say w- things sort of change your perspective when you started treating your career like a business because there seems to be a divide, especially early on, like younger comics feel like you can't have it both ways you can't be creative and have a good business mind i'm of the same mind as you treat it like a business you have to actually if you want to make it a career and and not have a day job eventually but a lot of people seem to think 
if you're good at the business side, it takes away from the art side. And that's a syndrome I find in Canada a lot, where comics in Canada, it's like, fuck that, I'm all about the art. And they're, especially, again, earlier on, until you realize the reality of it, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of comics will think, I'm just going to be myself. I'm going to focus on my art and wait for opportunity to fall in my lap. Mm-hmm. And it often doesn't. Mm-hmm. And in the States... People get that early on, comedians. They, they, they recognize the template. They get merch. They get the th- comics that maybe shouldn't, arguably, sometimes mm-hmm. even work. But they are working because they have that business sense. In Canada, it seems like you're made fun of if you have a business card. People are like, you have a business card? What do you... Uh, they'll talk about that for... You know, that's a whole thing. Right. So I like that because you're a good comic, really good comic. And you're constantly working and evolving and, and uh, working on your art. And your business is not taking anything away from that at all. You're creating yeah. you're creating huge amounts of material, you're churning it out. So it's refreshing to see someone that can actually, you know, do both and lay that myth to rest. Do you find any truth in that in what I'm saying? Like Well, I mean, I I'm guilty of it myself. When I started out, my whole attitude was, oh, I'll just do my thing, I'll be funny and uh, you know, the rest will follow because I'm just gonna be great. It's not enough anymore. Well, yeah, that was that's a thing too. Even back when I when I started, there was the glimmer of that possibility. Although that really, realistically, that you know, for the most part, a lot of the opportunities were ending by that time. You know what I mean? It was like it was pretty much the boom ended in the mid, or sorry, the early to mid uh, '90s, maybe something like that. And by the time you know, I by the time I got to a point, a level where I was ready for some, some opportunity, you know, this is where you start hearing the older comics saying, "Yeah, just for laughs." You know, they used to be words. You know, they'd hand you a development deal for five hundred, holding deal for five hundred grand, and those days are over. Like, so I kind of heard the typical like, you know, post baby boomer sort of, "Oh, it used to be a lot better with everything back in the, my day." <laughs> yeah. Oh, we hate you, you greedy bastards. But, yeah. uh, but I. Uh, yeah, I mean, I sort of, I'm not b- business minded at all. And even like when I talk about the business, it's sort of like at whatever level I can, I'm not, you know, I, when I, I think of a guy like, like Jerry D is a guy who's a, a more, I feel like a businessman first. I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe comparatively, but you are a business mind. I mean, if, if you totally are. Uh, especially compared to compared, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah, the thing is, business. I mean, this you is, have a website, yeah, <laughs> right. No, no. <laughs> I mean, like, I, well, like the thing is, though, it's like you have two it's albums. Like, th- when I say that I'm not like naturally a businessman, and uh, I, I think in, if you compare me to people who are truly who are starting a small business, right, right. they're they're you know they're much more organized in that way. Mm-hmm. If you're comparing me to other comics, I think that's you know, I mean, you know, that's. <laughs> Like that's not. It doesn't really have to. You're comparing somebody. It's like it's like. Well, I mean, you are you're like an Olympic level walker. Well, no, you're comparing me to a, 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 a one year old. I mean, you know, it's like, it's, you know, it's like if it's people who can't even walk. Well, uh, it's because because some newer comics listen to this, so it is good to know. Uh, you know, to have an edge in this business, just just uh, sharpen your business. In a and sense. it's and it's not really like I say. I'm not really. It's just, all it is is just. Um, being available and a lot of it too like I I got a lot of what I got from asking that's the other thing too is Mm -hmm. I think at first I was waiting to be given things and then I realized well I don't have time to wait here I want to get these and and and, you know being a bit of a squeaky wheel can help Mm -hmm. Uh, not too much but you know just politely squeaky Um, but that's such a simple thought but so many so few do that yeah well I'm amazed like I mean I'm amazed that when there are you know I feel like I will at least take, you know, I don't necessarily, I'm not as um, driven or, or proactive on the business side as I'd like to be. Mm-hmm. But if there's an opportunity that already exists with something that I already kind of have, then yeah, I'll be open to it because I want to be able to pay rent so I can continue to do what I want to do. I'm amazed when I hear like comics, like, oh yeah, yeah, I gotta, I gotta, you know, either when you say build a website, like I'm amazed when I've heard like comics who still, don't have a, a mm-hmm. website or, or have some way of contacting them online other than Facebook maybe. Right. Um, or, or the fact that like they, they're like, Oh yeah, I should, yeah, I should make a CD, you know, cause having like for the last couple of years, everybody has heard about the fact that you can make royalties off of, uh, you know, satellite radio and stuff. And, and that, they still are like, yeah, I got to do that. I'm like, well, what else are you doing? Like, you right. you already have the material. It's ju- it's literally just organized, calling up a guy to set up. He, you don't have to do anything. He'll set up the recording. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you pay him, but it's an investment. You'll make your money back way, you know, many times over. 
just get them to record it. And then even people who have CDs, oh yeah, I gotta send that. And then people who have the CDs that are playing, they're like, yeah, I gotta sign up for those royalties. <laughs> I'm like, what else are you doing with your time? It's a, it's a, it's, you know what I mean? It's like, it's filling out a form. I mean, like right. I know forms aren't that exciting, but what's less exciting is working at a coffee shop because you didn't fill out the form, or you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that's. Let's I, talk I'm about that. You've, by that. you've seen a lot of success with um, royalties and and your comedy being played on satellite radio. How did you find out about that initially? Um, that that was weird. Uh, I was um, I just sent my album uh, to I think it was XM. It was before they even. Uh, merged merged together yeah and that was like in, in 2007 i mean as it is i i was i tended towards being more physical as a comic when i was younger i tended to be more like um uh i like the idea of visual being visual and then um and then i uh i, f I was gonna tour out west for the first time and and other, a lot of comics were saying, oh, you want to have something to sell. See, it just goes to show that I'm not that business mind. I had other mm -hmm. comics tell me to have some merch, which you were saying, like, that's a very American, Americans are on that immediately. Well, they don't have health care, so, you, you know, they have to right. make sure that they can cover their bills. Um, but uh, I, I made that CD specifically. So I had to actually start thinking in terms of writing jokes that are, uh, are not visual. Mm -hmm. So that was a new thing. So I, I spent time doing that and then eventually had enough that I recorded my album. And um, when I recorded it, uh, I even added like some audio sketches that I did because a friend of mine, he helped me do it and we used some studio time to do that. And um, I didn't sell that many. I made like, I, I still have boxes of these CDs, right? <laughs> How many did you like? I got like a thousand. <laughs> That's aggressive for first order. Well, I don't know. I just like, I was just sort of like, yeah, you know, I just make them. You know, yeah, they right. still sell. Whatever. I don't know. I had no sense. Again, I'm not. I tell you, I'm not. A, you call me business minded. It, a lot of it's trial and error. Um, and then, uh, and, and then, I kind of I find kind of funny. Like I did. My intent wasn't to give it to satellite radio. I was just thinking I got the CD. I might as well get it out there and mm -hmm. you know get some airplay in the states and all that sort of thing. And then it wasn't until two years later that I'm reading on a comedy blog uh, that there's this service called sound exchange that is run by the library of congress that uh, collects royalties for all digital media which includes web streaming and you know so it's like pandora whatever but also satellite radio which actually ends up being the bulk of it because they have subscription fees you know everybody gets stuff off for from the internet pretty much for free but satellite radio actually has subscription fees so i um i signed up for it and it was like a, the process was like uh was, uh, you know, some forms that were kind of a drag to fill out. There's a lot of forms, but it's not that much of a drag, so get on it, comics. But um, uh, it took like six months to process. And uh, I was actually in L.A. at the time, and my writing work kind of dried up a bit, and I was starting to acquire a bit of a line of credit debt. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, something's got to come soon. I better get like a like a national, U.S. national commercial or something because mm -hmm. it's starting to really build up. And uh, nothing was coming in. I was thinking, okay, well, I mean, I may have to go back home and to regroup if I don't get. And then I, um, I got this first uh, check. Actually, sorry, yeah. So I was when I call, I called them up to ask them how much to expect, and the guy's like, ah, about two grand or something like that. It's like, oh, that's good. I'll take two grand. You know, cover, yeah, cover some rent and whatnot. And then uh, I got the first. I feel weird because I don't want to really talk about the monies, but I, I got the first check that covered all of my debt and mm -hmm. which was fair amount mm -hmm. and it was way more than I was expecting mm -hmm. and I was it was sort of shockingly more than I was expecting so I called the accounting at sound exchange and I was like yeah I just want to confirm this is not a typo <laughs> and uh and he said uh, and he's like uh, yeah that's um yeah that's right that's your and those are the artists fees and it looks like you're the rights owner as well so uh, you should be getting another check for about the same amount Holy shit. So then I had like, now I have like a nest egg that I can live off of for a while until I can f wait, figure out my next gig. So that was like a gift from God telling me, keep 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 on keeping on in, in, mm -hmm. in LA. And um, uh, yeah, and then that turned into quarterly checks that just keep coming. And now it's like kind of a, it's like a living wage. Right. And so everything I make on top of that is just kind of gravy that I can put towards back in the business or savings or whatever. So that is huge. I mean, that's why I recorded my second album. That's I now look at comedy as not just being, you know, having a, a, an act that I can try to get in at clubs, but it's creating content. So, right. so that's why I like the idea of going out and 
working on new material because now I've got a kind of a carrot to help me. Totally. I, yeah. So it's a different it's a different way of looking at my act. It's I don't I just I want to come up with as much new material as possible to keep that going, which is great. I mean, it's great for comedy. It's great. In, it just didn't exist before. I, you know, comedy on the radio for me was the Sunday funnies for two hours where yeah. they play Cosby and uh, oh sorry did I mean and uh, Carlin <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, maybe not as much anymore, but uh, yeah. So so that's that w- that's really pretty great for comics i think it it is great and you say you got there by trial and error but the point is you got there and again i'm telling you outside looking in you have you've you've got the business side p- pretty locked down right. or at least you're ahead of the game uh by a lot maybe in your eyes if you compare it to like a jerry d who's like really really business oriented mm-hmm. you you've got that shit man because even like um like you said, just getting the sound exchange, that's that's it's just a little bit of paperwork that most people I I am guilty of that, of just not getting it done. <laughs> get on it, Julian. I, I have this office that's that's one of those things I have to get on. <laughs> um So your business sense comes for you're not lazy. Okay. So it's a roundabout way of asking where where do you stand with substance alcohol and drugs because this is an industry that's inundated with that kind of stuff it's so easy to and i feel like that's what holds a lot of comics back Mm -hmm. and by back i don't mean necessarily artistically i just mean on the business sense of getting off the couch being that squeaky wheel getting that paperwork filled out I feel like the substances often is is what gets in the way because you often get paid with free drinks. Right. You get offered a joint after. People give you weed. People give you coke. You know, just it's you're it's you're in that coke? business. Nobody's giving me coke. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not now. But um, so, where do you stand with that? Did you ever have a problem with booze or drugs or? Um, are you a big drinker? I'm not. I I don't know if I would say I'm a big drinker, but I uh, I do. I've, I have drinks at shows and things like that. I find actually sometimes I, I you know I catch myself. I'm like, why am I having a drink now? What do I right. need to? Why do I need this pint of beer? The like, act, like it's let's. Why am I having like a couple of slices of bread and adding that to my right, gut, right. gut or whatever? Sometimes I re- I realize oh I'm I'm having a drink and I don't even it doesn't even do anything for me. Mm-hmm. I don't feel a buzz even, mm-hmm. but I'm doing it out of a kind of a boredom. Like sometimes you know I feel like before waiting to get on or something like that. I feel. Like, you know, I, I get kind of restless. Like, I'm not yeah. always great at watching comics. Like, some comics I can watch, or if I'm in the mood, that's cool. But, I mean, if you're out every night, some you know, some com- some guys, I think, maybe love comedy. They love to watch what, mm-hmm. everything. But sometimes I just feel like, eh, it's something to do. I'll have a drink. Or, you know, it just it gets to be this kind of habit. It can be... Um, helped sometimes i'll just say oh i know i'll just have a glass of water and sip at that instead and that'll feel like i'm doing something yeah um and uh yeah i I think that like there have been times where where i was i'd be hanging out you know some comics will hang out more than they should i've even heard you know the comics feeling like hanging out that's you know that's part of the business it's you're, you're networking and it's like or is it an excuse to be in like partying like you're a teen? Yeah, who are you networking with at an open mic with a bunch of comics? This, yeah, it sort of feels like it's kind of an excuse. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I you know, I'll I'll sometimes be in that mode or whatever, and pro- probably even more than I should be or something like that. It's not really to the point though where it's really affecting me. But I do see guys that you know that's. They they treat stand up a little bit like it's a nonstop party, mm-hmm. like it's a it's it's um just the hangout, like that's part of what they love about stand up. Mm-hmm. But it's like yeah, but that's fun as a as a young man's game. But when you see guys getting older, it starts getting to be like, well, what are you doing? Like, yeah, what, you know, you, then you're now you're just a drunk. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and also and also with smoking up too. It's like guys that are like um, chronic or something like that. I, I just think like, oh, well, I mean, I mean, I guess you're, you know, who knows how bad marijuana can be, but I also feel like you're not actually living in, you're living in, a, in an alternate reality totally all, right. all the time. Hey, I was, I was that guy yeah. for, for a number of years. Yeah. I, I feel like it's, it can be an excuse. You can sort of say like, hey, this is just, what I find funny about, about uh, pot is that there's like a culture about it where where you it's a badge of honor almost to mm-hmm. be 
So yeah, but you're still doing a drug. Like it's not, you know what I mean? Like it's not like you're, it's not like a hobby or like a, you know, like a, um, uh, like you, you play sports and it's kind of you define yourself by it. Like there's right. this idea of defining yeah. yourself totally. by a drug, which yeah. is bizarre to me that, you know, the, 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 the culture of it, it's like, uh, like as though you're, 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 um, these are herbs, healing herbs, mm -hmm. you know, there could be, you know, there are certainly properties, but if you're always high, um, you're sort of not yourself in some ways too. You're altering yourself. A hundred percent. You're numbing yourself to any, anything really. I was of that, um, you know, and, and what I realized about pot is that it's absolutely detrimental to personal potential. Right. You can't. For for me especially, it was it was a hindrance to my uh, ambition a hundred percent. I couldn't do anything, but I couldn't go a day without smoking it. It's crazy. It's right. been eleven months now, and it, my life has changed dramatically. We would not be sitting here having this discussion right. in the studio with this equipment, <laughs> like because I like I told you before the interview, I've been thinking about doing this for three or four years. Right, but. A day turns into a week, turns into a month, turns into a, a year on pot because you're like, I'll do it tomorrow. Sure. Oh, uh, next week. And do you then, not? Do you not? Do you not smoke at all now? Nothing. Oh, I, okay. I quit everything. I quit drinking. I right. quit smoking, and I quit uh, caffeine, which I've been dabbling in with uh, half calf, half calf, half decaf coffee right. recently. <laughs> right. But for the most part, uh, no, uh, I'm fully, in, and it's amazing the difference. So I, I was kind of curious as to just to bring it back to you. So you've obviously never had an issue with pot. Well, or, for me, or it's like what's weird, the weird thing with with pot is that um, is that like for some people, I guess it's they they become um, they become kind of like more mellow. They become like couch potatoes, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's uh, it's just like brain, brain chemistry. It's the opposite effect. Like I, it is almost like a cup of coffee for me. It'll wake me up. It'll be I'll be. I mean, clearly, a lot of people become more talkative. I do, mm -hmm. um, but it'll also like make me. Um, Sometimes when I, you know, if I'm doing some writing and I'm bored with it, like for some show, I'll sometimes go, oh, maybe I'll have a puff and it'll make it more interesting to me or something like that, right? Which is a crutch that I don't always do, but I mean, I've, I, you know, I'll admit that I'm guilty of that. Um, but I also feel, or if I do, I can't do it too late because I'll be up until five in the morning because right. it's like coffee to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really see it as being something that makes me lazy necessarily. Sometimes it'll make, sometimes it'll make me focus. Sometimes it'll make me unfocused. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly if I'm cleaning my, uh, my apartment, it'll, uh, it helps with that kind of stuff. <laughs> I think if you, more interesting. if you can have a relationship with it where you do dabble once in a while, that's great. I mean, cause I love pot. That's the problem. I love it too much, right, right. It, but for me, I can't, it's the only substance in the world that I have had no control or have no control over. If I have it at home, I can't be one of those guys that has it at home and then, oh, I'll just smoke it at night as a treat. I'll right. come home. At, no, it gets me out of bed in the morning. I wake yeah. up, like, oh shit, pot. Yeah. I don't, yeah. See, the thing is that's, and I think that's a different personality thing because for me, Absolutely. that's not even like, I've when I've tried to do that during the day, it's a different, I, I actually feel differently. It's like, I feel kind of weird. It's a weird feeling. It's not, it's right. an unsettling kind of, uh, I, I feel like for whatever reason, I feel a little more relaxed if it's, after the yeah. after dark yeah during the day there's something about the sun and how i handle it's too much uh stimuli at right. the same time or something you know because i because i have because i it does sort of like you know charge me in some ways mm -hmm. you know let's um so let's get back just a little bit to the uh comedy uh discussion a number of bits mm -hmm. recorded last year yeah last year uh, actually, sorry, this I'm, year. I'm saying I'm just saying yeah because I checked my watch because I realized I have about uh, eight minutes before I have to ch uh, do something with that. Uh, oh, the parking, parking meter. Yeah. Oh yeah, we, you'll be good by then. We're gonna go for the close. Okay. Let's just talk about because uh, you recorded a number of bits uh, at Yak Yak downtown here, right? Yeah, it was uh, recorded in um, was it April? I think it was April. Yeah, this year. Cool and uh, success. Um, yeah, I would say so. It was. Uh, I mean, I did. A, I tried to market it. I tried to take advantage of. I think th that's one thing that I think is good to do if you're a comic. Mm -hmm. so anything that you're doing, because com because a stand-up comedy doesn't sound particularly special to anybody who's writing about things, um, and and the fact that it's always, you know, you're always doing it and you're doing the same jokes and adding new ones. It's it's kind of never has a finality to it. So I, I like the idea of like if you have an album and you're putting on an album, that's a good way to take advantage uh, take advantage of that to get yourself out there. Like mm -hmm. I. Like because I was gone from the Toronto for a while, not a lot of 
people or there's some people who've never heard of me because they started doing stand up after I'd already left or something like that, or they you know checked or they, you know fans of stand up or whatever. So I wanted to the, use that to take advantage of it to put it out there, you know, have a decent looking album cover, get that out there, put posters up, and do like an. I was able to to have a release party during North by Northeast, and I kind of used that to kind of kind of up up the profile of, right. of the release um, and get press for it and all that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I would say it's a success in that sense. And, you know, it's on satellite radio. I got, I did a run of, uh, you know, CDs. People don't buy them as much. I have like download stickers and things like that, mm -hmm. but I did a run of CDs cause people like to like to buy them after shows and stuff. And I want, I did a tour, uh, across Canada and sold the new CDs uh, after the shows and got some press to write reviews and it's all been positive and it's been really nice that way. Uh, 100 CDs. I made a run of 100. <laughs> Not a 1,000 this time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, you know. And I sold them all. I, I just came back from uh, uh, Halifax and St. John's and, and I sold and I sold the uh, the last of them. That's great. Yeah, so, you know, maybe I'll do another 100 runs. Sold out. Success. Yeah. And uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, you spent some time in L.A. Uh, a few years back mm -hmm. uh, on a work visa and now you're working at getting your green card. So is that's the plan to go down in L.A.? and? Uh yeah, I mean, I just I was I was gaining momentum and, you know, things were doing, doing all right. I didn't leave because I ran out of opportunities. I just I just uh, had to, the, the green card didn't go through the first time. So I just got approved now after you know, like I say, doing some new things. And oh, so you did get the green card. Yeah. So I, you're approved. Yeah, I just, it's a matter of just going through the process to actually get it, so. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Congrats. That's huge. Thanks. And so um, you're going to move down to LA and will you keep a place here? Will you do the... the I think I'll, I think I will divide my time a little more. One thing I learned in the, this process is like I kind of completely didn't really con keep connected with Canada and there's still opportunities here that I could continue yeah, to pursue. Yeah, of course. It's easy to sort of fall behind here mm -hmm. if you're f too focused down there. That's right. You, you do kind of like a day job and force yourself to go out at night. Right. You kind of, if you're all in LA, you kind of have to force yourself a little bit to uh, to do things in Canada. Cause, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can get opportunity here and just for laughs, stuff like that. Just keep sort of doing that thing at the same time. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be a lot better with that. Great. And yeah. when do you foresee moving down there? Um. Well, I mean, I you know, I don't want to jinx anything, but I'm hoping by February because, uh, cool. you know, February, it's uh, winter yeah. in uh, Toronto. Yeah, it is it's the, fucking winter in well, Toronto. Well, the, it's the very worst. And apparently we've got another bad one, another... Uh, T-Rex, they're calling it. T-Rex of a winter. Oh, the t it's a T-Rex vortex? T-Rex vortex. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So it's uh, so as long as that mean that it doesn't notice you if you don't move? Yeah, it has a really it short does, yeah. arm. If you don't leave your house, <laughs> yeah. you, you're, you're you're okay with it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I, uh, I would like to just avoid that because yeah. I mean I don't mind winter up until it gets to the point when you hit February. You're like, I I, I just I just can't take this anymore. <laughs> yeah. 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 So cool. Well, listen, I'll let you uh, be on your way. Anything you want to plug? For of course, a number of bits available on Amazon and iTunes and alexnussbaum.com. Yeah, and Twitter at Alex Nussbaum and N U S S B A U M. Thank you. Alex Silent K A L E X. No. 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 Uh, I'll edit that out. <laughs> Alex Nussbaum A L E X N U S S B A U M on Twitter and .com and all that good stuff. Um, thanks for doing it. Anything else you want to add? I um I, I, I really I really like you. <laughs> and I like you. Thanks, buddy, and watch your head. Thanks, Julian. And there it is, episode number 20 is in the books. 20 episodes deep, everybody. We're doing this. Uh, thanks to my guest, Alex Nussbaum, for dropping by. That was a good chat. Thanks to my producer, Adam Fox, and my sound engineer, Miles Lacroix. And uh, thank you to you for having listened for the last 20 episodes, or if you're just, if this is your first one, thank you. Either way, thank you. Appreciate it. Remember to uh, rate and subscribe on iTunes. That makes a huge diff in my world. Also, listen to the end of every episode uh, for bloopers, little inside, little, little glimpse, little 30-second, 20-second peek into, uh, I don't know, what we're doing here, maybe. So if you haven't listened uh, to any other bloopers, go back, L open up an episode, go right to the end and listen to, yeah, just that, bloopers. All right. Email the show, podpod at jdcomedyhour.com. 
Facebook.com slash JD Comedy Hour. Follow on Instagram and Twitter at JD Comedy Hour. I think that's everything. Thank you always. Appreciate it and watch your head. Chatting, but uh, I have I'm good, but I uh, I have a, about an hour, no I have about an hour on the uh, on the meter. Oh okay, so let's uh, let's do this then, <laughs> Jen. We're gonna get into it, so uh, just remember to be quiet. <laughs> 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 so remember this picks up everything. Can you hear me? Can you I hear can. Me? Yeah. How's can you that? hear me? Yes. Okay. Let's check your levels. Yeah, oh. these are my levels. <laughs> <laughs> Check, check. One, two, one, two. <laughs> Hi, way. One, two. Check, check. Okay. Get, get comfortable. You can adjust the mic in every possible direction. All right. Just get nice and cozy. Yeah. Lean yeah. back and relax. Lean back. You're sitting forward. You're sitting up, sit up forward. That's a good um, right. interview. I'm sorry. Right. That's right. And, uh, okay. The way it works... Um, we just, uh, I drop in a clip of your stand-up. Yeah. And then we come back from that. Okay. So, like, the format of the episodes is, uh, it starts with the intro. Um, I do, like, a 15-minute preamble slash monologue with some segments and stuff. Then we get to my guest, you. I drop in a clip of your stand-up, and then we come back from that, and you're magically in studio. Oh, beautiful. I'll let you do your thing, then. I won't do the the preamble. I'll do. Oh, I see. Like after, a, oh, I see after, after, yeah, yeah, yeah. after you've yeah, get a sense of what the hell would just happened.